This is the Discovery Files podcast from the U.S. National Science Foundation. I'm Nate Potker. An interagency effort has come together to produce a global artificial intelligence research agenda, a document crafted to serve as a starting point to align a global research vision in which research communities continuously assess the state of AI research, review publications addressing the presented priorities, and identify gaps to guide future research. We are joined by Michael Littman, the Division Director of Information and Intelligent Systems and the Computer and Information Science and Engineering Director at the U.S. National Science Foundation, and Joshua E. Porterfield, a Federation of American Scientists Impact Fellow in the Department of Energy's Office of Critical and Emerging Technologies. Thank you both for joining me today. Great to be here. So I want to start with a little background and get to why you guys are interested in AI. Michael, I know you worked with computers for a long time. How did you become interested in artificial intelligence? Yeah. So for me, computing was always about getting computers to do interesting things. And I think that the field of artificial intelligence is really about that. I came of age in the 80s when there was a, a national emergency that, uh, that Japan was going to do better in AI than us and we needed more AI scientists. I'm like, oh, I can help with that. Fantastic. Uh, Josh, I know you have a background in chemical and biological engineering. How did you become interested in AI? Well, it's it's quite the circuitous pathway, but I was doing my PhD at Johns Hopkins focused in nanomedicine, and I actually defended on the last day the campus was open before the COVID-19 pandemic, um, which led me to the Johns Hopkins Coronavirus Resource Center, which everyone probably remembers from the fun maps on CNN every night. And that really inspired me to put my efforts towards science policy. I get to work at the Department of Energy now, where I got to help stand up our brand new Office of Critical and Emerging Technologies, which is really the front door for DOE on AI, biotechnology, quantum science, and microelectronics, so that we can really work across all of the different offices and national laboratories to kind of have a unified DOE vision on critical technologies and work with our partner agents. So... Michael, as one of the partner agencies, can you talk a little bit about how NSF is working with AI technologies? Yeah, so NSF has been supporting AI research for longer than I've been in AI, which is, and, that, and I'm telling you, that's like the 1970s. So this uh, the NSF has been supporting AI research since easily the, the, the 60s. And it's gone through many different phases. This current phase obviously is one that's very visible to the outside world. But a lot of the things that we're seeing come to fruition right now actually were research topics 20 years ago. So NSF has really been involved in, in bringing these t technologies out, helping to mature them and giving people a chance to, to work with them. So moving towards the global thinking we're having here, Josh, can you tell me a little bit about how the Department of Energy is working on a global scale? Yeah, so we, we, similarly to NSF, have a long and storied history with artificial intelligence. DOE shepherds the 17 national laboratories, which house the fastest openly benchmarked supercomputers in the world, let alone in the United States. We've really been building on kind of that uh, compute capability, the workforce at the national labs, that expertise, and a lot of the open scientific data created at our user facilities to really contribute to this interagency and international effort on AI. And so we've been called out in the AI executive order for a lot of different things, everything from developing red teaming processes to make sure that AI models are safe and secure, to providing foundation model resources, test beds, a lot of things that you can find at energy.gov slash CET, resources for the public both nationally and internationally. And so a lot of our international AI research really comes out of the Office of Science, where we can do this open science work. So we have collaborations across partner countries on federated learning, a lot of work on the next generation of AI hardware and supercomputing capabilities. Our labs also initiated the Trillion Parameter Consortium, which is an international group of collaborators that really look to build, test, and deploy some of these large AI models. And so really this kind of evolution of DOE's engagement in AI has kind of led to our new proposal called Frontiers in AI for Science, Security, and Technology, or FAST, which is really how we envision coming together with our partner agencies, the international community, the industry community, to kind of really build the next generation of AI models that are going to fix some of these major problems facing the world right now. So a new research agenda is what brings us together. So Michael, can you tell me what this agenda is? So it's worth pointing out that the the idea for the GERA was first 
made public in the executive order on artificial intelligence, which the Biden administration issued in last October. So we're getting really close to the one year anniversary of it. In that document, there was a, a a whole slew of things that were that were requested of the or I guess demanded of the agencies to actually do. Some were targeted at particular agencies. Some were par- targeted to all the agencies. And uh, this particular item it mentioned uh, creating a global AI research agenda, so which we've been calling GARA, but it doesn't actually say GARA in the in the document. We now know that this is actually the name of a monster from Godzilla. So that was you know foresightful. It's not a monster. It's actually a really great thing. Uh, so the, the idea of it is that the, the executive order said that the State Department and U.S. aid agencies in the U.S. would put together a, a global AI research agenda. Basically, what, what should we all be doing together to help move AI forward in a way that advances artificial intelligence for the benefit of the entire planet? The authors of the executive order they felt that the State Department and U.S. aid have the expertise to really connect the, the, a U.S. vision to, a, to to help turn it into a global vision, to really connect with our partners in other countries. They also asked the Department of Energy and the National Science Foundation to be a part of the development of, of the research agenda because, well, global well, AI research really happens at, at these agencies within the federal government. They also ended up bringing in, or we also ended up bringing in, the Department of Labor to help out with the issues that have to do with the the way that AI is being developed uh, worldwide involves employing a lot of different people to do a lot of different kinds of tasks. And this is not happening within any given one country. This is actually happening across the world. And so a lot of the decisions that get made in terms of how AI is pursued actually have impact on workers everywhere. So it was really wonderful to have the Department of Labor also involved, bringing their expertise about workforce situations to the development of this this agenda. It's pretty visionary from the executive order to move towards a research agenda because a lot of the conversation internationally so far has really been about setting up guardrails and making sure these things are safe, secure, trustworthy, which is absolutely a priority. And we have the USAI Safety Institute to house that work, and it's working with international partners actively on it. But this is really kind of the hopeful part of what can we do for the people of the world? If we've got this technology, we're sure it's going to be safe. Where can we start deploying it? Where can we start fixing things? I really like that way of saying it, because I feel like what we're, what we're doing is instead of being reactive to all these things that are just happening and we're like, what's what do we do? This is proactive. This is really thinking about what is our long term vision? How how do we see AI developing in the future? And what are the critical research questions that we need to be answering now and working with our global partners to answer now so that the future of the world is bright? So thinking about global partners, one of the questions that came up when we were discussing this beforehand why should U.S. agencies be setting what the global standard is? Yeah, that's a great question. I don't think this the document is intended to tell the rest of the world what they should be doing. I think the I think the purpose of of creating Agera in the first place is first of all for us within the U.S. to recognize this is a global endeavor. We can make all the kind of decisions that we want about what we're doing, but we really should do this in collaboration and coordination with the rest of the world. And so I think this is kind of our 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 offering out into the world saying, this is how we're thinking about this. This is how we'd like to work with you. Let's get this conversation going. I think it's really important to point out that in terms of AI research, so I've been an AI researcher. I don't know when you officially become an AI researcher. There's no ceremony for that. But, uh, But for me, my first research paper was in 1989 and I went to a conference and it was a global conference in the sense that there were researchers from all over the world. And so my entire career in AI has been interacting with not just folks in the U.S. doing AI research, but folks everywhere in the world doing AI research. It's a global academic community. And I think recognizing that, that this isn't that we're not making these unilateral decisions when we're talking about AI research, we need to be working together as as a team. That's that to me is the is is kind of the impetus for for doing something like this. So thinking about that teamwork, I, I want to ask each of you about your role in composing this document. Can you tell me a little bit about how you fed into that? Yeah, absolutely. So so in our in our broad mission space of science, energy, security, department of everything, um, we really wanted to make sure that the research that we're funding and the research that we're interested in, these kind of gaps and priorities are identified in the document. You know, everything from the pressing issues of climate change to clean energy deployment, 
Um, AI for science, such as materials discovery, is a great thing that we can work with our, our international partners on. And so I think that a lot of these issues that we're talking about addressing in the global AI research agenda are not things that can necessarily be tackled alone by the United States, especially when we talk about something like climate change, where their impacts are vastly different around the globe. You need different data sets. You need different people to train these models. And so we really wanted to focus on things that require kind of the global community to come together in this effort. Do you want to elaborate on how you worked with different agencies in this process? Yeah, for me anyway, this was this was one of the most fun things about this is that it really required bringing together the perspectives of these five different organizations. And they're not just, it's not just that they're different organizations, they really come from very different backgrounds, right? So Josh thinks about the role of AI in science and trying to move science forward and and can speak as a scientist, right? Not as, not necessarily simply as an AI oriented person, but like, what is this actually mattering to the science? So that was a really important perspective. I brought a perspective and NSF brought a perspective that was with respect to, well, this is how AI researchers do their work. And these, and we had, there's particular language that we use when we, when we, um, when we gather people together in conferences and we ask them to submit papers and so forth. There's a whole culture there and it's a different culture. The, the State Department and USAID, they are like from where I sit, they seem very similar. They like worry about other countries. But in fact, they do very different things and they have their own individual cultures. There were moments during the, during the, the writing process where one group used a term that to the other group meant something very different. And we decided we should just strike that term. Like, even though that's the term that would typically be used by folks at USAID when they're talking about uh, the global community, it has different connotations in the State Department. And so we just, okay, we're going to say that a different way. So their, their perspective on how we all get along as a global community was incredibly valuable and very enlightening to me. And then again, as I mentioned before, the Department of Labor, they brought their perspective and they used a lot of very specialized terminology. I'm a computer scientist, right? We have all kinds of crazy words for things, but I couldn't understand a lot of the stuff that they wrote at first because they they, they had a very sort of economic framing for the, the things that they they talked about. And so we would go back and forth and say, when you say this, does it mean the same as that? And they're like, well, yeah. I'm like, great. Can you just say it that way? Because I think more people might understand it. So it was just a wonderful kind of process. Everyone was very open and uh, engaged. And we really wanted to do something, not just to check a box, because this was something we had to do for for the executive order. But we, I think we all came in with a feeling that we would like this to actually have an impact and really try to make things better. And so that was just a great, great way to collaborate. How do you feel about being involved in this agenda and setting the standard that is going to hopefully go forward? Yeah, I mean, I think I think it's important to note that, you know, the AI executive order and the Gyro process was not the beginning of interagency collaboration on AI and it and it sure isn't going to be the end of interagency collaboration on AI. But as Michael was pointing out, I think it was great to really get these different perspectives together and I think the Gyro was a great catalyst to force a bunch of different people, scientists and people at the agencies to speak the same language so that we can actually communicate with the public appropriately. And so I think it's great to have a product that's coming out that can actually, you know, decipher what does the U.S. government think about AI right now and where can we get involved and what's coming down the pipeline. And so I think that's very exciting. And then additionally, you know, as we continue to chart this course together, how are we going to have safe, secure, trustworthy AI for good? I have a great number of new contacts and partners that I can reach out to, you know, when something comes up within the different mission spaces of these various agencies and departments that I think we all understand a lot better having been in a room with each other for multiple hours crafting this thing now. Zoom room. Or Zoom not even room. a Zoom yes, room. Virtually. Yeah. 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 virtually. It's great to get to actually be in person. So um, thank you for coming out. I do want to also mention that we have a national strategic plan with regard to AI research and development that's not a global plan. Um, and so one of the things that we did when we were developing the Gyra is to scope it so that, okay, we've already established these are some really important research topics in AI that are about AI. Let's focus on the research topics that are really going to help build this more global community and, and answer questions that, that, that come up when you're really thinking about how AI is impactful across national borders. Yeah, I mean, we get outreach all the time from different countries saying, like, we want to work with you on AI. What can we do? And they... The answer really so far has been, we're working on it. So I think this is great to say, we've got something now. Why don't you take a look at this? Where can I engage? 
And I mean, even from a perspective of a bench researcher 10 years ago, it would have been great to have kind of a guiding document of where's the U.S. government thinking it's interested in right now so that I can write proposals and think about research directions that maybe align with where the funding could be going one day. Of course, the funding organizations will make their own decisions on where things go, but this is kind of our North Star, hopefully. Exactly right. So with both of you having a research background, I've talked to a lot of people that have used AI in, say, uh, labs, like you, you mentioned, using AI to find different kinds of materials. And I, I'm curious what either of you is excited about and where this might potentially be going. I think up to this point, up to three or four or five years ago, it was like, oh, could we create like an intelligence that would actually be able to converse with us and, and, and help us solve problems? And we sort of have the, the pieces of that now, right? We have actual programs that we can have conversations with and that can actually bring help bring insights. So for me, the, the question has shifted a little bit from not how can we just create this external intelligence that's going to be out there in the world and do things to how can we use this technology to enable people to solve the problems that they want to solve? And so for me, that's about telling the computers what to do, right? They're there, they're there, they can do work for us, but we have to express to them what it is we want them to do. And I think some of these new developments like, like language models and chatbots help provide a, a much more natural interface so that anybody can tell these machines what to do. Now it's still on all of us, all of us, to figure out what we want the machines to do for us, but it's become so much easier to tell the machines once we've made that decision, what to do. Yeah, I think it's, overwhelming almost every day to see the number of things that we could be applying AI tools to. I mean, just working with our colleagues at the National Laboratories, I've seen everything from AI systems that are now trying to predict the conditions we need for nuclear fusion to AI that's now speeding up permitting to get new clean energy on the grid, which is incredibly impactful. And we keep getting questions from Congress about because there's a multi-year backlog in people trying to connect new energy to the grid. And we've seen that we can develop pretty quick AI chatbots to help people through the application process, help summarize these things. And so really thinking about all the different application spaces that we can use AI in is, is pretty exciting. And that's why we really need to keep engaging with our partners in public, the industry, and internet nationally because we're not going to see each of these use cases come across our desk. So we need to hear where where should we be developing the next cool AI tool. So the, the last question I want to ask you guys is thinking about this from a public general consumer end of things. What is the benefit of a global AI research agenda for the average person? I think that's a really interesting question because probably most people will not read this document. But if they were, it's an interesting document. If they were, I think they would find it interesting because it it, it provides a window into the thinking of the research community as to what the, the key topics are going to be moving forward. I think really the impacts, though, are going to be visible down the line, right? So that so that if the if the recommendations of this research agenda are taken, and I think we're already acting on a bunch of them, so it's really happening. What we'll see is better cooperation, better collaboration across countries, and more focus on helping AI be something that is valuable and trustworthy and beneficial. And I think that just makes people's lives better. And so that's that's what I am most excited about with regard to the public is, is hey, I think this is going to really help us do a better job making, making a tool that's going to benefit everyone. Yeah, and I would say that I, I think a lot of members of the public are, are rightfully worried about the impact that AI is going to have in everyday life, especially when it comes to their jobs. And I think that's what was so excellent about having the Department of Labor involved in this process to really show we are concerned. We are thinking about how this is going to play an impact in daily life. How's it going to impact hiring? How's it going to impact job assessments? Those sort of things. So that at least as a member of the public, you maybe know that we're thinking about these things a little more now and taking it seriously. But I also think it's kind of a call to arms of saying that we have a large breadth of stakeholders that should be involved here right now. And it's not just AI professionals. It's not just computer scientists. We need the basic scientists to come in and create the data to train the systems, test the outputs, make sure it's working. We need the social scientists to talk about impact and think about how we're actually applying these in a responsible manner. I mean, a lot of this thought wasn't given when social media kind of came on the scene. So now we're trying to do that a little more proactively this time. Time. And the Gyra really sets out that there's a lot of different groups that need to be involved in this process, and we're kind of ready to engage with you. 
Very cool. Well, thank you both for joining us today. A uh, special thanks to Michael Littman and Joshua Porterfield. For The Discovery Files, I'm Nate Potker. Please subscribe wherever you get podcasts. And if you like our program, share with a friend and consider leaving a review. Discover how the U.S. National Science Foundation is advancing research at NSF.gov.